Okay, so try to solve this, and uh, there are many different products that you'll get. But I would suggest that you draw just the major product of this graph. So inductive effect of alkyl groups tells me the things that are uh, more likely to remain as uh, carbocation are the carbons that have the highest inductive effect coming from this other carbons that they're attached to. Alkyl is an activating group, and that is why it can provide the lone pairs that you need for the positive inductive effect. So the more the alkyl groups, the higher the inductive effects. For example, in the first option, you have this carbon as one option where uh, you can get the bromide ion, and one is this one. And this one has is a secondary carbon, so there is a lesser inductive effect compared to this one, which is an uh, tertiary carbon. So there's the inductive effect from this methyl group and also the other ones. So two options, one, the bromide goes here, or two, the bromide goes here. Now, of course, bromide being the more negative one will go towards the tertiary carbocation because there's that's more stable. So what we'll end up with is this hexagonic structure to show the cyclohexane and then this methyl. Of course, that remains there, but there's also bromide joined with that. And the other one will get hydrogen. We don't need to show hydrogen because uh, now, if you still want to know, then this is what it looks like now. Before, there was just one hydrogen over there. So that's the case. We don't need to show hydrogen. The minority product, minor product for this case would have been that you get CH3 here, but on this one, you get bromide. And uh, you can use Markovnikov's rule to, um, as a shortcut. So Markovnikov's rule says the one with more hydrogen gets the other hydrogen. So right now this one has a hydrogen, but this one does not. And that's why this one also gets another hydrogen. Using Markovnikov's rule, we can say the same thing. So I don't understand right. how to do it through Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule simply says that if you're adding hydrogen ion, then the one that already has hydrogen is more likely to get the next hydrogen. So, but how do we know that the secondary carbon has more hydrogen? Because right now, this has three bonds, so the fourth one definitely must be hydrogen. But this one already has four bonds shown, so there is no place for hydrogen. Remember uh -huh. that hydrogen is a filler in all organic compounds. If a few bonds are shown, the ones not shown are with hydrogen. And carbon must always have four, oxygen must always have two, nitrogen must always have three. Now, a generalized version of Markovnikov's rule would be that the thing that is uh, with more hydrogen is the one that will get the less electronegative thing. That's a generalized version. So even if you did not have hydrogen, you had something else like anything that was less electronegative than bromine, then you will get that over there at the secondary carbon over here. So that's a generalized version of Markovnikov's rule. Okay, let's look at the second one again. This is tertiary carbon because it's attached to one, two, and three carbons. And uh, this one is a secondary carbon because it's attached to one and two only. So because of that, we know that uh, there is a higher chance that bromide will come to the tertiary carbon. So everything else remains as it is. And this carbon gets another hydrogen. And this carbon gets a bromide. Obviously, it's attached to CH2, CH3 here, and uh, CH3 here. So nothing gets out, it's just that you're adding HBr, and this is electrophilic addition. And the reason it happens is because of the double bond having uh, this cloud of pi electrons, which are slightly delocalized. So they attract the HBr, the H positive part, and the electrophilic addition happens. The mechanism is the same as what we've done so far. Now, electrophilic addition allows us to make many things from alkenes. For example, if I have an alkene and I add steam to it, and the condition is I must have phosphoric acid as a catalyst, I must have high temperature, usually 300 or 350 is fine, and 100 atm pressure, then I can get an alcohol from it. So ethene, you can convert it to ethanol. The mechanism, if you want to know, that would simply be that I have ethene, C, H2, double bond, CH2. I'll show it as this one. Sir, can you scroll up for a second? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is work in progress. We will fill this diagram, this map. So half it short though is clearly. So if I have this here and I bring, let's suppose, H2O here, then this is already 
uh, negative like that, and there's a slight positive chart, slight negative chart, and slight positive pair. So what happens is that uh, this lone pair, uh, this uh, delocalized electrons, this pi electron attacks this. So I show it using a curly arrow. I don't need to show this, this crescent to show the pi electrons, but I need to know this. What that does is it pushes the electrons towards oxygen. And now what happens is that you're going to get, what it does is that it converts this to an intermediate and that intermediate has carbon joined with hydrogen, one of them, and the other carbon is a carbocation. And there is OH negative with lone pairs. In fact, three of them because two it already had and one because hydrogen left over. And now this lone pair attacks the carbocation. So remember the curly arrow shows the attack of lone pairs and the half curly arrow shows the attack of a single electron. And now that converts this to uh, obviously alcohol. What alcohol? This one is going to be ethanol because you get OH here. So this is ethanol. And that is made because you have electrophilic addition happening. And that's all possible because of the electron cloud of double bond. So that is how you convert any alkene to alcohol. So you can do this with, again, with many different things. So for example, if I ask you to complete it for these two, give it a try, go on. You don't need to show the mechanism, but remember that every double bond will get steam added to it. Sir, why steam, why not water? Why steam and why not water? Because uh, I think it will have to do with the movement of molecules. Uh, it's easier for gas molecules to collide because they have higher kinetic energy and all that. Okay, so here's what happens. In the first one, uh, again, because both of them are secondary carbons, it doesn't matter which one gets the uh, pH and which one gets the OH. On one of them, you're going to get methyl and the other one as well. And the other one, you're going to get OH like that. Okay, so this one is going to be uh, but 2 ol uh, Similarly, in this one, you're going to get two alcohol groups added. And uh, there's a high chance that this one will get OH negative because it gets, according to more conical rule, this gets the more negative thing. Similarly, in this one, this is more likely to get, because it, again, it's more likely to make a stable carbocation. So once you have identified what's your carbocation going to be at, then you just complete the bonds and there you have it. So I'm going to get an OH here. Okay. And... Uh, and another way here. Okay, so that leave that gives me what? Uh, this is also a branch there. So it's going to be two methyl, uh, pent one, two methyl, pent one, two, four diol. That's the compound that I'm getting. Of course, I'll need two. The yeah. first one wouldn't it be butan one ol? It is butanol, yeah. Butan, butan two ol, not one ol, because this is the second carbon. How do you know? Just start from here. So this is the second carbon. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's how you get uh, them converted to this. Similarly, you can add the hydrogen to alkene and you will get same process. So if you add hydrogen, so if I add hydrogen and uh, my situation is that I'm going to have high temperature again, usually we keep 200 to 300 degrees Celsius and we need nickel catalyst, okay? And this reduces it to alkene. So I can take an alkene, add hydrogen and it will convert to alkene. This is what we do for cycloalkenes as well. So if you have a cycloalkene, that will also convert to alkene, obviously cycloalkene. The cycle does not break, the chain does not break. It's just that wherever it is unsaturated, you get hydrogen added over there. Uh, this is a major industrial process in uh, ghee industry, in mar making margarine, you do this. And uh, I'm planning on visiting one of these uh, factories. I just talked, spoke to, uh, people, and I'll be visiting their factory in uh, uh, June. So if anybody wants to go, I can we can like make a trip out of it. Next, we have oxidation of alkenes. Now, oxidation is interesting for alkenes because it does two things. If you have an alkene like uh, this thing, and you add oxidizing agent. Now, oxidizing agent I'm going to show as this. In presence of water, it's really important that you have a oxidizing agent dissolved in water. And if it is cold, like the temperature is like room temperature, no heating, okay? Then what happens is the double bond breaks 
and OH is added to both the carbon. So you get diol. So this one's going to be F12 diol. Uh, also, when it is aqueous, if you want to speed up the process, you can add an acid or an alkali. Doesn't matter which one, because our job is just to split water into H and OH. So adding acid or alkali allows for faster reaction. Why? Because it splits water more. Okay, so you can have a faster reaction if you add acid or alkali with the oxidizing agent. And oxidizing agent must have water because without water, this won't work. And the temperature is normal, room temperature would do. But if you do this thing at high temperature, that is called, so this process is called oxidation. But if I do strong oxidation, which means that I will break the bond and we call that cleave. So we will cleave the bond. The double bond is cleaved, it's broken, and uh, that will convert it to every carbon atom will be individually oxidized. And pay attention to this, because this is something that will carry forward for the next few chapters as well. You have to understand what happens to carbon and hydrogen when it's oxidized. So if the carbon is primary carbon in an alkane, so for example, something like this. Let's say I break this down and over here, this is a primary carbon and this one is a secondary carbon. First of all, the bond will cleave. So there's cleave. And uh, then what happens is that this carbon is now individual and it will oxidize. So what happens to an individual carbon when it's oxidized? It converts to carbon dioxide, okay? So it converts to carbon dioxide, this carbon. And what about the hydrogens here? These two hydrogen. What happens when hydrogen oxidizes? Water. But what about this other, uh, this phase? This carbon is not primary carbon, it's secondary carbon. So what that does is it breaks down and forms acid. So because of the inductive effect of this methyl, it is possible for carbon to remain in the, uh, uh, like in the form of, uh, this uh, organic chain and what it does is that now this breaks down and forms carboxylic acid so now you're going to get the same thing but now you will get this thing here carboxylic acid so you've gotten um, ethanoic acid here so if you think about it what happens is that this carbon breaks down forms carbon dioxide the water break the hydrogen breaks down these two and they form water and this whole thing breaks down and forms methanoic, any acid that you have, ethanoic acid, propanoic acid, which means we can use this process to make acids. We can just take any uh, alkene and we can convert it to organic acids by strong oxidation. But what if it is a tertiary carbon? What if uh, this had something like, this was a methyl group and this was also a methyl group. Now it has multiple things providing the inductive effect. So the cleavage happens, the bond breaks. And now this one, which is obviously primary carbon, it converts to carbon dioxide, water, sure. But this one, which you cannot now add OH to, you can't add OH because you don't have any space for that. Over here, we had the space. Over here, what we did was, this was hydrogen, we oxidized it to OH. Sure, we were able to do that. Although that's not technically oxidation. But over here, what will happen is that you cannot add OH anywhere. So what do you do? You just add oxygen where you've broken the bond and you are getting a new family of compounds, which we call ketone. So to summarize it, primary carbon, primary carbon converts to carbon dioxide because it's individually oxidized. Secondary carbon converts to carboxylic acid, but it doesn't do that right away. It first converts to aldehyde, which then converts to carboxylic. We will talk about this process in detail later on. Okay, but for now, just skip the aldehyde part. Uh, there's a reason why we're skipping because uh, to get aldehydes, you need to stop oxidation midway. But because this is strong oxidation, we are not stopping it. So it goes to completion and forms carboxylic acid. Incomplete oxidation will produce aldehydes but uh, that's not happening yet. This is strong oxidation. And then we have tertiary carbons and tertiary carbons will convert to ketones when they oxidize. Provided you're doing all of this in presence of 
oxidizing agent and sorry and high temperature so to summarize what happens here is that if you have alkenes and you take the oxidizing agent at room temperature then this at room temperature it breaks down and forms diol but if you take this alkene and you oxidize it at high temperature then cleavage happens and it converts to multiple products carbon dioxide uh, water ketone or carboxylic acid depending on what kind of carbons you have so that is the case of oxidation of alkenes so so far we've seen four reactions now try to figure out what the product will be in fact let me give you a few more examples of this so let's suppose i have uh, okay i have this compound let's first identify this one is tertiary this one is uh, secondary so obviously the bond is going to break from over here there's cleavage going to happen and now on this one i'm going to get ketone right the double bond breaks and i'm getting ketone and on the other one again the ketone part the carbonyl group happens but i am also going to get oh on this side so i've converted one of them to carboxylic acid and the other one to ketone uh let's try it for another one what if i have a c going like this again pretty straightforward uh this one's going to form carbon dioxide and water why because again cleavage happens this carbon forms carbon dioxide these oxygens or these hydrogens form water and the other one which is a tertiary carbon breaks down converts to ketone this is prop one propanone uh same thing happens if you have cyclic compounds for example uh if i had this thing now what will happen again you have to understand that there are two carbons here even though one is shown and the other one isn't but this one is still a carbon and this is a tertiary carbon because it's attached to one two and three carbons okay uh unrelated note what is the hybridization status here do you know what hybridization this one has so the way to remember that is look at the sigma bonds one two and three sigma bonds which means three orbitals involved in hybridization so sp2 okay but this one is sp3 hybridized because it has four sigma bond uh, sorry that's also sp2 hybridized because it has three sigma bonds as well two with hydrogen one with this carbon all right so again when you have a strong oxidizing agent high temperature the cleavage happens and now you're going to get carbon dioxide water and on this carbon sorry on this carbon you're going to get the ketone part okay so the bond breaks from over there and you're left with uh, these products so it depends on the carbons that are attached in the double bond how they are now what if i have a cyclic compound and this one is a little tricky sometimes so for example i have this and that's the case what happens if the double bond is part of the uh the ring so the ring breaks down again cleavage is going to happen this is going to be cleaved and what am i going to get i am going to get a straight chain obviously because uh this is no longer going to be a ring what's going to happen is that this one is a secondary carbon and this one is a tertiary carbon so this one will convert to ketone and this one will convert to carboxylic acid because it's a tertiary carbon so let me just uh, draw it by opening the ring so i have six carbons in the ring so 1 2 3 4 5 6 on the first one which is uh, i'm keeping this one as the first one remember that ring breaks down everything opens up so this one is going to be carboxylic acid now which means i'm going to get carboxylic acid here and what happens to the last one last one had a ch3 attached to it so it's technically seven in the ring now or seven in the chain and this carbon over here will convert to a ketone and this is important because whenever you break a ring it might get difficult uh, to break the ring and draw the complete structure but remember that the principles remain the same the bond cleaves and gives you carboxylic acid for secondary carbon 
ketone for tertiary carbon and uh, carbon dioxide and water for the primary carbon. And the reasons are pretty straightforward. You are oxidizing everything to the maximum extent. A tertiary carbon is only able to form uh, two bonds with oxygen, so that's why it forms ketone. A second carbon is also only able to form aldehyde and then further oxidize to a carboxylic acid. And a primary carbon in this case will completely oxidize. Again, this is alkenes. Uh, primary, secondary, or tertiary will change their behavior a little bit if the bond does not cleave. Important bit is that the bond cleaves. Uh, later on, you will study or oxidation of uh, straight chain compounds or alcohols. And in those cases, you will notice that if, because the bond does not cleave, uh, their behavior changes a little bit, okay? But because the bond is breaking down over here, you are getting uh, these results. So that's complete or strong oxidation of alkenes, okay? Uh, the last reaction is pretty straightforward, and that is simply polymerization. It is nothing new. It is just like... Uh, the polymerization of addition polymerization that we studied in olivals. Uh, just need to remember that uh, you have to like study the uses or different properties of these. So for those, I'll send the notes in the group. And that's it. That is how you get alkenes converting to different things. So four reactions of alkenes that you need to remember and uh, they're right here. Uh, so again, you just have to identify that this is a secondary carbon. This is also a secondary carbon. The breakdown hoga, so they will both convert to individual carboxylic acids. There's going to be a cleavage here. So you're going to get uh, this thing. And uh, yep, that's one. And same thing twice. So two ethanoic acids. And uh, in this one, you're going to get uh, double breakage. So this one's going to break here. This one's going to break here which is interesting because this chain will remain. So kind of the molecule, basically the molecule will split into three parts. Uh, I'll start from the left side. So this side, because it is a tertiary carbon, it will convert to just this. So that is propanone. And uh, the middle one, which is like this, and uh, these are both secondary carbons. So they will convert to dicarboxylic, okay? Mm, sorry, and uh, the rightmost one will convert to carbon dioxide and water. So this example is pretty interesting because it checks all the three cases. And again, the only possibility where this is happening is when you have high temperature, all right? And yeah, that is alkenes for you. Uh, there are ways to make alkenes from other compounds, for example, we alcohols ko dekha tha, ke alcohols will convert to alkenes through elimination reaction, agar aapko yaad ho. And, uh, but we will talk about alcohols again. Similarly, we halogen alkenes abhi padna. Usme bhi, there will be a way to convert it to alkenes. So alkenes can be made from haloalkanes, from alkanes, from uh, alcohols, and they can also be converted to each one of them. And uh, the process is addition elimination. Sorry, not addition elimination. The process is electrophilic addition for that. So, we have these three main reactions. Which you have to know. The first two are addition, and the other two are oxidation. Okay, so we are done with alkenes.